Hey guys, welcome to the Winter Feeding Series. Uh, this is our second episode in this series, and today's topic will be hay feeding methods. I am Terrell Davis, the Ag Agent in Pike County with the University of Arkansas Division of Agriculture. A few of our objectives for today. Number one, we will discuss uh, several different uh, feeding methods and include the pros and cons of each, um, including the percentage of waste that we can expect um, and also the ease of delivery. I think the percentage of waste is probably a, a great focus for us uh, because we can kind of see um, how much of what we've worked so hard to obtain can be wasted. You spend a lot of time, um, equipment cost, uh, fertilizer cost, all those things add up when we're making a bale of hay. You've, you've got a great investment in it and we wanna make sure that the, the largest portion of that actually gets in the animal and provides for uh, that animal's nutritional needs. Uh, so again, that'll be a large focus on what we talk about today. Uh, we need to remember as we go through this that all operations are very unique, just as unique as the people who manage them. Um, and that being said, uh, we take this with the understanding that there's not one method that's kind of fix all for everybody. We're all different. Uh, we have different styles. We have different time commitments. So there's not one method that's going to work for everybody. Hopefully what I, you can see out of this video is that these methods exist. Here's the pros and cons. And you've got some good information to make a well-informed decision for your operation. And lastly, um, for our objectives, is that we will consider uh, supplemental nutrient needs um, that need to be integrated in how we feed our cattle. And that's actually where we're going to begin. Uh, last video we did was on the nutritional needs of animals. So I'm not going to go into depth here. If you need more, then feel welcome to go and visit that video. But we do just establish that all animals depended upon their uh, stage of development have different nutritional needs. In our charts uh, here below, uh, one we have on the left hand side, um, the, uh, the demand for milk production in a cow uh, according to months past birth. And then on the right hand side, um, I listed a table that presents uh, different breeds and their requirement, their uh, daily milk production um, at peak. So you see a lot of that milk production at peak between that 15 to 20 uh, pounds a day mark. And then you've got a few breeds that are, are larger than that. The Simmentals and the Gelbys have that 25 plus. Obviously, if they're producing more milk, then there's going to be more nutritional needs. These are averages, so you know there's going to be some animals that go above it and there's going to be some animals that go below it. Um, back to the left hand side, you see that months one and two are that cow's uh, biggest lactation months after birth, one and two months. If you're a fall uh, calving person, then you've probably actually uh, been okay and, and might have passed that. So if you calved in, in September, then um, September and October, you probably had something to graze and she's past that peak. So winter might not be so bad. However, if you uh, birthed in, in October, then nutritional is your, uh, sorry, November is your biggest nutrition month. So obviously supplements probably gonna have to happen. If you're a spring calver, uh, consider that too. February and March, there are probably some months that might need supplementation. Uh, if you have babies in March, then you've got grass coming on and you probably will make it. April, you should be fine. Uh, so just take those things into consideration uh, for your operation and their nutritional needs. Uh, and so we talk about nutritional needs first because I think it's important that we establish there is a need and the more waste that I have and the more I deteriorate my hay, then the more supplement I'm going to have to add. Probably you don't have terrific grass in the first place. Uh, I see a lot of 9-10% proteins coming through, which means that there's going to be some supplementation. If we degrade that even more, then obviously we're going to have to add some more uh, supplementation to it. 
A big part of hay storage methods to me is where we store, uh, sorry, hay feeding is how we store our, our hay before we ever put it out for the cows and consider those nutritional needs. Uh, so we have some folks that store under the tree line. Uh, I didn't want to go and take a picture of anybody's uh, methods. So this is all generic uh, internet photos. So it's not a great tree line photo, but I think you get the understanding. This is when we bail the hay in the field and we store the bales on the edge of the field, probably under some trees. Um, we had that idea that the trees are going to actually protect it, that it's kind of uh, God's covered storage. However, we do have to consider that uh, when it comes to rain, it's not really protected from rain. And honestly, all the rain that's going to come off of the canopy of those trees is going straight to those bales of hay. Because we've shaded it, there's not as much sunlight to make that hay dry out. There's not as much evaporation happening. They're probably stacked pretty close and the trees are also blocking wind. So the wind's not getting in there and drying them out either. So essentially with a lot of tree line type storage uh, situations, we've increased, we've given microbacteria a haven um, to be able to break down plant material. And that's the last thing that we want to happen. So there's a lot of mold and mildew that happens under tree line. There's a lot of decay that's going to happen under tree line. If we're using uh, grass twine, a lot of times those will break and we've just got a huge mess when we try to feed it. So consider that if tree line is something that you have to do, maybe you just got through doing that last cutting in September and October and you didn't have any more room in the, the building, that's fine. But let's feed that hay first before we feed anything else so that we can save our, our good stored hay uh, for later in the season. Next method that we wanna talk about is covered storage. So obviously this is going to be probably your largest expense that you're going to have as far as storage methods. Uh, maybe you have an old barn that you can use or an old chicken house that's vacant and you can use. That's great. That definitely decreases the amount of investment we have here. Most likely if you got that old chicken house, you've, you've already paid for it. It's, it's done its job. You don't have a contract anymore, so why not make it a hay storage unit? Uh, totally makes sense. However, if that doesn't exist and you have to build something, then that's going to be a large investment. At that point, you've got to see whether that's going to give you back a return. Is the amount of hay that you've stored um, saved and the nutritional value that you've saved um, worth the investment of that covered storage? Um, so hopefully at the end of this, you'll, you'll be able to make those types of decisions. Um, and our last one is an open field. So it's kind of a combination between the, the last two. Um, obviously, there's not any cover there. However, when it does get wet, there's plenty of sunlight, wind that can come through and make this situation a lot better. Um, so open field might work for you. And honestly, it's better than the tree lined option. Um, some modifications that we could do this, uh, maybe set out some telephone poles if you had an opportunity. I've seen people who have used pallets uh, before. Anything to get them off of the ground is really going to add some value to your hay bales. We uh, probably need to discuss a little bit of how we actually put our hay together, okay? Because there's this idea uh, that, that some of these um, might help a little more than they do. So obviously twine is our cheapest option. Uh, a lot of people have gone to the poly twine. I highly encourage you to make sure you've got every piece of that off of that hay bale before you feed it out. Um, cattle will eat it. It will not digest. It will be a big old ball in their belly. Um, and you've got a huge problem at that point. Um, maybe they can pass it, but most likely they can't. And you're gonna have some issues there. If you're using um, grass string still, um, there's this concern of breaking down before I can feed it, right? Um, it's a lot safer for the cattle, but also it's not as durable. So something we have to consider. Uh, if we're storing outside, we really have to think about twine. It's not protecting much at all. 
um, and we're going to have some decay there. Net wrap, on the other hand, or plastic mesh, uh, it's an impermeable material, right? It doesn't soak up water, so we feel like we're doing a little better. Um, there really is kind of this outer layer shield kind of thing going on. However, uh, research has shown that um, there's still quite a bit of water able to soak through. Um, again, you've shielded a little bit from that sunlight. So it has its pros and, and cons. Uh, and again, we've got to make sure that we get that net wrap off before we feed it to our cattle. Um, and it becomes something that, you know, we've got a waste product at the end of the day when we feed our, our hay. Um, but it does hold things together a lot better. Um, and and especially if you're going to store it for more than one year, it's really a good way to go. Um, but again, it doesn't shield it as much as we might think. Last option to solid plastic wrap, which is basically haylage, requires the same moisture content as the other two. Uh, we are not making silage at this point. We're just storing it under a plastic wrap really is, is the only difference here. Um, so it really is just about the same as a covered storage. So if you can't afford to build that building, then this might be an option for you. Uh, it doesn't have to be the setup that I've got shown here, which is, is super nice to be able to have that. Uh, but even if you can get it up off the ground and then tarp it, uh, same concept exists as covered storage. We really need to understand uh, hay bale composition, I believe. You've probably seen this image before. I've shared it on social media before. Um, this is on a, a, a bigger bale than we're normally used to. A lot of times we deal with four by fives or five, five, five by fives um, in Pike County. So the smaller the bale, the percentages are gonna change. They're actually gonna go up. Uh, but on this bale, it's saying that the outer six inches of uh, the hay where most damage is actually going to occur um, because of weathering accounts for 33% of this bale, right? So one third of this bale could potentially uh, be useless, be waste to us, depending upon storage method. Um, and we will we'll look at that as we go through. And then obviously the closer we get to the center of the bale, very little damage is actually done. Uh, but it also doesn't account for as much of the bale as we go into it, right? Uh, so we have a uh, wonderful publication um, called the Hay Management uh, Guide. It is MP434. You can go to uaex.edu, search for MP3, uh, MP434. Um, and all this information is in there. Um, really good stuff. So this was a study um, that compared uh, weathering to uh, losses in crude protein and to TDN, okay? Um, some figures that I didn't put in, but I think are really important. So the depth of the weathered layer. For the plastic mesh, it was uh, two inches. For the solid plastic wrap on the ground, it was a half inch. Uh, for... Uh, Sisal twine, it was 4.4. And if that same twine was inside, there was zero uh, amount of decay, okay? I think that that's pretty awesome too to, to look at how deep the damage was. Uh, so we went from none to uh, about four and a half inches on this study that we're looking at here, okay? Uh, so in this one, we have the unweathered bale um, the interior portion of that versus the weathered layer. And when we look at crude protein, really there's not just a, a huge difference between those two, um, but there is some difference. So you might ask, why is the crude protein actually higher in the weathered layer? So you're telling me this might be an advantage to me, right? Um, the problem is, the fibers in this hay bale um, actually become more concentrate. So it gives the um, illusion sort of, of, of crude protein increasing. However, when we go to the next slide, which shows digestibility, you see that digestibility goes way down um, on these weathered 
um, hay bales. So yes, there may be more crude protein there because there's more fibers there, but the digestibility has gone down and it's really not something that can be utilized. Um, and I think that this is a more important um, observation than the crude protein because it has to be digestible. It has to be able to be broken down, provide that energy for those animals to be able to use. Um, and so that's kind of what I take away from these two slides is that according to storage methods, um, digestibility can really be uh, affected. And I want to briefly talk about spontaneous heating, because I think that that's also a big portion of storage methods. Um, so it's a negative consequence of belling hay before it's adequately dried. Uh, I have some ideal moistures down there at the end. Um, I say go more towards 20%, but 25 to 20% at baling is where we kind of want to see our moisture be at. Um, and, and what happens is that um, these microbes begin to respire as they break down um, the sugars. They're eating the sugars that come off of the fibers, okay? And when they do that, they create a heat. So the first five days is when we actually have the most heat. Um, and so if, if you looked at um, any of my, my past um, information on uh, hay sampling, which is what our last one uh, was on, then you'll see that um, we, we really need to allow that process to go through its, its thing um, and maybe sample a month or so after you've bailed it. Um, at least two weeks after you've built it to allow the microbes to kind of settle down. Um, and after this five days, then the heat really kind of goes down and there's not much respiration happening. Um, you can determine your moisture by using the microwave method or the air fryer method. Um, I used to be a total component, uh, proponent of microwave, uh, but then I've recently set our microwave on fire. <laughs> And the air fryer seems to be a little better for me now. Um, okay, so what I actually said that I was going to talk about, I'm going to talk about. Uh, so here's, here's our first method. It is rolling out bales of hay. Very popular method of feeding, um, requires no additional equipment. Um, you know, you, you got a good hill, you got a good way to roll out hay bales. That's kind of how we do things around here. It is our highest waste. 45% of the bale can be wasted um, if we put out more than one day of supply. So if we're putting out for three days worth of feed for these animals, uh, rolling out a couple of bales, then we have a really high amount of waste. They're gonna trample on it. Uh, they're gonna poop and pee on it. And then it's just not something that they're gonna wanna eat, right? So we really um, waste a lot of hay this way if, if this is a method that we're doing for a couple of days worth of, of uh, supplement. Uh, you can decrease waste by placing that poly wire over the middle of the row and that way they aren't able to kind of trample it and, and cause that damage that we might have had. Um, only roll out what you need and if you do that then you go from 45% waste to 12% waste and I think that's pretty awesome. Uh, rolling can help add nutrients to the pasture soil, so it does have its advantages. Um, so consider that in, in your decision making that you are adding something to the soil. So it's not all total loss. Uh, that 45% loss is going to turn into nutrients and organic matter, and that's good for your soil. But at the same time, it's probably a lot more expensive than fertilizer would have been. Uh, we could feed in rings, and I've got two different types of rings here. It's probably the most popular method of feeding hay besides the rolling out thing. Um, it is the most economical feeder that we could probably put out. Our estimated hay waste is about 9%. Um, if you go with that solid sheet of metal at the bottom, um, it's estimated that that loss is at 6%. So just simply buying the, the ring feeder with sheet metal at the bottom can decrease uh, 
loss by 3%. And it just keeps it within that ring. It doesn't allow it to come out because you know what's going to happen when it comes out the bottom. They're going to trample on it. It's going to have big mud mess. Um, so something that we really have to think about. I would suggest moving your uh, rings around. I know there's um, this conversation between the sacrifice area and moving nutrients around. And my personal opinion is when you move that around, you don't have this huge buildup of organic matter. Um, and though you may not necessarily have a sacrifice area, I think it does a really good job of adding those nutrients back. You're going to have this waste. So why not spread that waste out instead of uh, having an acre or two that's just piled and piled and piled with old hay. Uh, there is a modified cone ring, which seems to be um, a really good uh, choice if we're going to use rings. It's estimated that the waste from a modified cone ring is about 5%. I think the, the biggest part of this is that it keeps the hay off of the ground. Um, it's not The hay bale's not going to set on the ground. It's going to be lifted up in the air. Um, and so they can eat from the bottom of it or they can eat kind of from the sides too. But you notice that there's some, some larger holes here that can really get their heads in there and, and eat off of that bottom as it hits. Um, I really like, and this may just be for display on this one, but I really like that this one is on concrete. I can see how that would be really a, a good setup. Maybe to, to lower that cost, we put it on gravel. Um, but that way we're not got this big muddy mess that we have to worry about at the end of the feeding season. Um, and I just want to bring across that um, University of Tennessee has done a lot of work on this fence line feeding system. It really um, catches my eye. Uh, but as we've gone through, I've got more questions about it. Uh, but I think that it is a, a pretty awesome kind of situation here. So basically what you have is a, a permanent feeding station. Um, you you uh, feed by the picture at the bottom. It shows that, you know, you're on the outside. So it is a, a safe way of doing things. So if you are elderly or maybe you have a parent or grandparent who is still feeding the cows um, and you have concerns about getting trampled and what have you, uh, this is a really safe way to do things. It allows them to still have their independence and do their thing, but not have to worry as much about what the animals might do to that person. Um, and, and the reason that they did this and, and the funding that from my understanding is to decrease water uh, pollution and, and the hay loss. So here we don't have this big muddy mess washing down into a stream. Um, and so that might be something that you're interested in if you've got a lot of water on your um, operation. And as laws change, that might uh, change on your priority list also. Uh, but it is a really cool system. Here's some things that I've, I've learned about it that at each of these stations, only about 10 animals can eat. So they have uh, uh, three of these uh, stations that they put the hay bales in so they can feed 30 at a time. Uh, it's a lot of investment for 10 animals to eat. Uh, the whole setup is estimated to cost somewhere around $15,000. Um, obviously, we could we could decrease that a little bit um, by going to, to gravel instead of concrete. Uh, we might be able to skimp on some other things and, and bring that cost down, but it's probably not going to be dramatic. So, you know, you're probably still going to uh, pay at least half of that. Um, so it has to be something that's well worth your investment, but something I want to just kind of point at and, and look at. UT, UT has a lot of information on it if you're interested and in, um, their website has a lot of good stuff about it. So let's talk about the cost of waste. So we've got a practical uh, application uh, listed here that you got 25 cows in your herd. Um, you have purchased 45 hay bales. These hay bales are a thousand pounds a piece. You paid $40 for them. So $1,800 total. Okay. Uh, you feed 15 bales uh, a month for three months. So the uh, the hay waste at the bottom, I simply um, modify this a little bit from, from what I had seen with other people. And I took the amount of estimated waste times $1,800. Okay, so my figures may be a little different from others, 
But um, with the open steel ring, we've wasted $162 worth of hay. If we put that sheeted metal at the bottom, we've wasted $108. The modified cone was the best at $90 of waste. And I really want you to pay attention to the rolled out bell that we've wasted $810 worth of hay. Uh, so again, I think that, yeah, it's got its advantages to put an organic matter back, some nutrients back, but really a buggy of fertilizer would have cost us a lot less than that and probably done a lot more good. So unless you've just got a real problem with organic matter, I don't see a lot of advantages to rolling out uh, more than one day at a time. If you're gonna roll out every day, I think it's a great way to go. You've got very little cost, put that poly wire on top so they don't lay on it and uh, you're doing well. But if you're rolling out a couple of bells so that you don't have to come back for three days, know that you're gonna have a lot, a, lot, a lot of waste and it's going to be expensive waste. So just to kind of summarize things, uh, if we feed hay in small amounts or a feeder, uh, we do minimize waste and some feeders are better than others. Uh, feed hay in a well-drained area. So avoid areas with excessive runoff, especially, but if you're at the bottom of the hill, you're gonna have a lot more water. So move it up to the top of the hill. Uh, feed hay stored outside before you do the inside stored hay. Um, that way you, you minimize the amount of loss from wind and rain and, and sunlight. If you roll bales, make sure that you utilize that poly wire to keep the cattle from um, pooping and peeing on it. And roll out one day of, of hay at a time. And again, that's 12% loss compared to the three day supply that's estimated around 45 to 40% uh, loss. If you have any other questions, here's my contact information. Um, as always, I encourage you to follow me on social media and Facebook, uh, Twitter, and Instagram. And then I also have a few podcasts. Uh, Forages on the Go is about a 20 minute podcast and the Pike County Extension Minute is um, anywhere between a minute to a minute and a half. Every once in a while I get long winded and go to two minutes. But anyway, we appreciate you again for, for uh, attending this. And if you have questions, make sure that you call me or your local county extension agent. I appreciate it and hope to see you again. Thanks.